Thanks again, everyone, and welcome to our third Thursday series, Garden Question Answered, Beneficial Insects in the Garden. Before we get started, I just want to give you a, a quick overview of what we do. We have our Gardening in Orange County blog and our Facebook page. So that's where we post, you know, relevant information. We plug our classes and our blog. Then if you have any questions, please call our garden helpline or send us an email. We're always excited to get questions and figure out what the answers are. And if we don't know them personally, we can always contact uh, some of my colleagues to get those answers for you. My name is Susan Njai, and I'm the Community Horticulture Educator at Cornell Cooperative Extension Orange County. And today I'm joined with two of our Master Gardener volunteers, Cecilia Lillard and Mary Pavadinsky. Beneficial insects. What kind of beneficial insects can I find in my garden? Well, there are three main types, predators, pollinators, and parasitoids, and each of us can tell you about one of them. So to start us off, Mary, tell us all about the predators we can find in our garden. Predators are kind of everywhere, and there are all sorts of different kinds. So we're going to talk about and look at a real diverse group. They're usually bigger than their prey, but not necessarily always. And sometimes their prey can be huge, like the cicada killer wasp that can carry cicadas that are twice its weight. Some of them are generalists. They will eat pretty much anything that comes their way that looks delicious. And others are specialists. They only prey on particular kinds of insects or other things. They can kill all life stages. Different kinds will eat anything from eggs to adults of other insects or even sometimes other invertebrates. And they kill a lot. They're not just, you know, one bug in the morning is enough. Lace wings can eat, the larvae can eat up to 100 insects a day when they get to their largest larval form. That's not too bad. Pretty much everybody has seen ladybugs. Even children know what these critters look like. But there are a lot more kinds than just the red shell two spot. Some of them have different color variations, more or fewer spots, different colors, and especially most people haven't really looked toward the larvae and those are really the more the most voracious eaters in the whole group the larvae look like tiny alligators in fact somebody some people call them aphid alligators they sometimes are dark with two spots sometimes they have slightly different coloring but they are extremely good at eating aphids in particular any kind of soft bodied um, pests like mites or tiny caterpillars. You can purchase ladybugs in jars, but it's usually better to see what actually comes into your yard on its own because once you release a jar full of ladybugs, if they don't find enough prey to stick around, they're just gonna fly away. If you put something out there and it starts attracting aphids, pretty soon you're probably gonna see ladybugs and larvae. Ground beetles, you probably won't see because they're mostly active at night. Please resist, if you see these things walking about, resist the urge to step on them and go on because they're very, very good at killing and devouring things that you would really rather not have in your plants. Aphids, root maggots, even slugs and snails. Some ground beetles can get pretty big. They can, they can be anything from tiny to large. But as I said, you don't really see them very much because they tend to hide under logs and rocks. And mostly they're just active at night. Ambush and assassin bugs. Some of these are pretty scary looking, especially the wheel bugs. Wheel bugs can be an inch, inch and a half long. And they all seem to have beaks because what they do to kill their prey is they stick the beak into it and inject it with toxins that paralyze their prey so that they can eat them at their leisure and they don't have to fight off the prey while they're eating it. They are very slender sometimes. The wheel bug has what looks like an actual wheel-like thing with spokes on its back. The other assassin and ambush bugs they're they're kind of formidable looking and they probably scare people sometimes as much as they do whatever they're about to eat although they, they some of them do have the ability to do some kind of biting but it's very rare unless you actually grab one to have any kind of 
bad effect. Nobody likes stink bugs, except there are a couple of kinds that really do a good job. You can tell the difference between that and the common marmorated stink bug because of the little spines on its shoulders. And they are very good predators of a lot of soft bodied pests, caterpillars, things like that. And if you can just take a quick look before you step on it and think it's okay, brown and marmorated, you might be doing yourself a favor. The two spotted stink bug doesn't necessarily have exactly these markings. Sometimes they're variable, but if you see something that looks like this or that looks like a variously marked stink bug, you might wanna leave it alone until you see what it's eating because two spotted stink bugs are very, very voracious predators of Colorado potato beetles. If you're bothered by those, that's a good bug to have around. Oh, uh, this is this is Susan's favorite lace wings. Lace wing larvae really are alligator looking. Every time I see them, I think, yeah, that really does look like it. Except that they have sideways jaws in the front. And that's really how they get their prey. They crawl along the leaf surface surface and they will devour aphids scale bugs, mealy bugs, thrips, mites, insect eggs. I love these things. The full grown ones can really consume about a hundred insects a day. That's a pretty good job. But the other thing you really need to look for with these is the eggs. The eggs are on a stalk. And if you see eggs that look like that, that's a good egg to leave alone because these can really be of help in the garden. The adults are just pretty. They're named for their lacy wings. Um, they come in green and brown and probably some variations in color, but nice bugs to have around. Praying mantids. Most people have seen praying mantid adults and the smaller ones, the, the nymphs, but the egg sacs are kind of hard to locate. You can buy them and set them out in your garden, but if you do, you probably will only end up with one or two actual adult praying mantids because they're carnivorous and cannibals. They will eat just about anything, including their own children, including their siblings. So it's quite a trick to get them out of the egg case and into action and not too many of them survive. But if you do see these egg cases, just leave them alone, let nature do its thing. They are not very specific. They will eat bees, wasps, pretty much anything that they can handle and a lot of things they probably can't. They come in green and brown and sometimes it's a lot of variation between the two colors. Predatory flies. I love these guys. I didn't really see them very much until I started looking for them. Robber flies are also called assassin flies and they eat grasshoppers, bees, wasps, beetles, all kinds of things like that. They inject them with um, uh, paralyzing agents so that they can carry them back to their nests easily. And surfeit flies, the larvae are really, that these are also called hoverflies. The larvae are really the ones that are great eaters of insects. They consume lots and lots of young termites, ants, bees, pretty much anything they can get their hands on. I think that one is eating a, a large aphid. Oh, I love this stuff. Hoverflies are also eaters of pollen. So they're also good pollinators. And if you want to keep these things around, it's a good idea to have a lot of plants that have heavy pollinating flowers. More common predators. I love these cicada killers, although they are pretty scary when you first see them. They're big and they're not always as big as the cicadas that they carry. Sometimes they can carry a cicada that's twice their own weight. They do kill them and you know you think well cicadas are so pretty and they make nice noises but they do feed on plant roots especially tree roots. So cicada killers will capture them, paralyze them, they don't kill them immediately and then they the females will carry them to their nest, 
which is underground, it's a burrow, and they put one or two of them into the burrow and then lay one egg in there. And when the eggs hatch, they have breakfast all ready for them. Caper wasps are, most people do not like to see these nests because they're scary. It's a wasp nest, get rid of it. But actually paper wasps are very, very good at preying on caterpillars, flies, beetle larvae. They also eat nectar and pollen when they can't get those things and they're good pollinators. So, you know, unless the wasp nest is in some place that you absolutely are, you know, need to go past every day, it's a good idea to see if you can leave it alone and just let them do their job. Uh, these are my favorites. Everything's my favorite. I like these things. Dragonflies and damselflies are pretty much the same family, same group. The different, the main difference that you see when you're looking at the two is the dragonfly wings, their pairs of wings are out flat at their sides and damselflies tend to hold them back up above their backs, kind of push together. Dragonflies are better flyers and damselflies are not quite as good at the, as, as dragonflies at flying, but they are both really good at catching flying insects. But really the main predator stage is the nymph. They spend most of their lives underwater, growing and eating, and they will eat mosquito larvae like crazy, tadpoles, even small fish, and all sorts of invertebrates that they find down there. Once they're in their flying stage, they take out a lot of flying insects like midges, gnats, and mosquitoes. I love seeing them fly around my garden because I know they're kind of on patrol and eating up all the insects that hatch. Predatory mites. These are not technically insects, but they're becoming extremely popular, particularly with produce growers and people who grow produce in greenhouses specifically. Predatory mites are the, among the few kinds of mites that will eat other mites. They'll also eat nematodes, thrips, white flies, and they're really a blessing if you're in an enclosed environment or you have a food crop that's infested by mites because they're, they, you can buy them in, they call them sachets. They're just a little envelope and then the mites go walking out and doing their thing. And it's a real, real help because mites are very hard to see, much less kill with chemicals and a lot of them are becoming resistant. The predatory mites will take them out a lot more efficiently and without using any kind of chemicals. The way to attract them, if you wanna get them, and I hope you do, is provide food for their prey. If you see an infestation of aphids or mites or whatever it is that's bothering you, Take a quick look at it and see what it's eating. And also look around to see if something is starting to eat it. Provide alternative food sources like pollen, like other kinds of plants that they may feed on or other kinds of creatures. Create overwintering sites. This isn't a problem for me because I'm very, very lazy and I don't care about cleaning up in the fall. But if you are really into cleaning up your garden, leave some leaf duff some areas that are, you know, just dead plants that they can crawl into and spend the winter. And always try to minimize pesticide use. Don't use it unless it's a last resort. Thank you so much, Mary. And now we're gonna talk about pollinators and that's gonna be Cecilia Lillard. So go ahead, Cecilia. Thank you. Um, Mary touched on some insects that are pollinators, um, but we're gonna get more specific in this. Pollinators, there's a tremendous diversity. And just like the predators, there are specialists and generalists. We're going to look at some of those. And the thing that's unique to insect pollinators is that they undergo a complete metamorphosis. The one insect that you're probably most familiar with is butterfly. So it goes from egg to larva, it pupates, and then the adult emerges. So all of these that we're going to look at now undergo complete metamorphosis. Everybody knows about honeybees, but they're not native. 
New York has about 400 native bees, and there are actually about 4,000 native bees in North America alone. So these are some of the bees that you can find in our area. The squash bee, it only pollinates squash, so it's a specialist. Um, I was reading about them, and they think that's one of the reasons squash is part of the Three Sisters. They were very important pollinators before the European honeybees came. Bumblebees, they do a great job. Digger bees, exactly as their name implies. And you can see they're kind of white, so you can tell them from other bees. Mason bees are solitary bees. Sweat bees are really tiny. They're usually metallic looking. And leaf cutter bees, they like to nest in cavities. And if you happen to open up that cavity, I pulled a piece of molding off and there were uh, leaves rolled up and it was just fascinating to see. So those are the bees we have. We're on to butterflies now. Most people are familiar with butterflies. We love to see them. They're beautiful and they pollinate a ton of flowers. So on the left, we see a yellow swallowtail and a checker spot and the painted lady and the monarch which are often confused. So now we're gonna move on to moths and they're the night pollinators. We see butterflies during the day and there's a luna moth on the left and a white line sphinx moth with a little pink. They're beautiful. If you happen to be out at night, you may be able to see them. Some of the moths that are active during the day are the hummingbird hawk moth and the Ilanthus webworm. The hawk moths are big. They, they do look like little hummingbirds. And then there are beetles that pollinate as well. So we have a soldier beetle on the left and a locust borer on the right. As Mary mentioned, um, paper wasps are also pollinators. So they're very beneficial for the garden. They're a little scary, but they're beneficial. And then Mary mentioned Hoverflies. Here we have two hoverflies, and you can see that they look like um, wasps. So most insects leave them alone. And then another pollinator that you may or may not think of are ants. They're always crawling all over flowers and gathering nectar for the nest. So they're important pollinators as well. And then the only one that we have that isn't an insect is the hummingbird. And that's the main bird pollinator here in the U.S. Tropical regions have lots of other birds that pollinate, but those are the most common ones for us. You've decided that it's important to have pollinators. How do you attract them? You provide shelter. And just like Mary said, I don't do much fall cleanup either. So you want to give them overwintering sites. You want to minimize your soil disturbance. A lot of them are ground nesters. So you want to leave some bare ground. And you can purchase or build mason bee houses. They're a lot of fun to build. I like doing that. As Mary said, you want to provide food for them as well. So because we talked about native insects, native pollinators, you want to plant native plants. And you want to provide a continuous bloom throughout spring, summer, and fall. If you plant in clumps, they're more likely to find the plants. And hybrid flowers often don't produce exactly what they like to eat. So if heirloom things are much better. And like with predators, you want to avoid using pesticides. It's very hard for them to handle. Thanks so much, Cecilia. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about parasitoids. So parasitoids are the least known of our beneficial insects in the garden, but they're super important and there's quite a few of them. Some characteristics of them. Um, they're all specialists, so they're not just going to parasitize anything, um, and they're all flies and wasps. And we'll look at the life cycle, and it has to do with that complete metamorphosis again, the egg, the larva, the pupa, and then the adult. Usually they're smaller than the host, but that's not always true. This is a giant ichneumonid, ichneumonid parasitoid wasp, um, and as you can see, it's quite large. It actually uh, can sense a larvae boring into the, the tree here, and it will actually has a very long ovipositor um, that it will stick it will drill into the wood to find that larvae and lay its egg on it. They use a specific life stage for of host. So if you're a parasitoid, you're either an egg parasitoid or a larval parasitoid or an adult, you're not laying your eggs on everything. And then it kills its host slowly um, because they're eating the host uh, from the inside out. 
And then each one only consumes one host. Once you have killed that host, you then have moved on to the next stage of your life cycle and you're no longer a parasitoid. So a little bit different than the other things that we've talked about today. So here is a great life cycle of a parasitoid. So this is an uh, aphid parasitoid. So here's, here's the adult. What it's going to do is it's going to sense out and find an aphid. Then it's going to use its ovipositor to lay that egg on the aphid. Um, when the egg hatches, the larvae, it's a worm-like larvae, will go in to the aphid and it will eat the aphid from the inside out. Then the, the, the aphid will eventually die um, and it will look like an aphid mummy, a mummy. They call them aphid mummies and we'll look at some pictures of what they look like. And then the parasitite emerges, it will pupate in there and it will emerge as an adult. So what does that exactly look like? So here are some real photos of it. So here is the parasitoid wasp laying its egg. Um, and here is the adult. So we don't have any pictures of the larvae, right? They're inside eating eating away. Um, and once it, it will pupate in there, once uh, it emerges as an adult, it will drill, it will cut a little hole. It's always a beautiful circular hole. And here's some examples of them. So here's one uh, that still has the kind of lid on it, but here's what it looks like. Um, and actually I've seen a lot of these in the garden. If you're looking at aphid colonies, you usually find them. They're super common. And I see that see them in most aphid colonies that I find. So that means that there are active parasitoids working on uh, controlling those aphids for you. Another really common parasitoid um, is a braconid wasp and it parasitizes tomato hornworms and other stinks and hawk moths. So it actually lays lots of eggs this, on this poor creature and they're all in there. And what they do is they'll you know, eat the caterpillar. It becomes very uh, lethargic and doesn't really move very much and doesn't eat very much because it's being devoured from inside out. And eventually um, they will come out and they will create their pupil casings on the outside and they will emerge as these tiny, tiny little wasps looking for their next uh, host to where they can lay their eggs. Some other really helpful things in the garden, right? We are not huge fans of squash bugs here, or these are harlequin bugs, which uh, don't overwinter in New York yet, um, but they fly up usually, uh, you find them in August and September, they fly up from the South where they're there all year long. Um, and so this is a beautiful uh, fly, Trichopoda. Um, and it will, you can see it's a fly because it only has two wings and then it has these little knot wings, the haltiers, and it will lay its egg on, here's the egg right here on this squash bug. Well, it will hatch and it will go inside and then it will, here's another one on this uh, squash bug nymph and it will uh, eat it from the inside out and kill it. So this is a really great example of a parasite that we all love, right? We're not huge fan of this brown marmorated stink bug. Um, and when it arrived here, it also brought about its parasitoid. This is the known as the samurai wasp, Chrysolcus japonicus, and it uh, parasitizes the eggs. And so instead of eating uh, the adult or the nymphs, it will lay its eggs inside and it will actually parasitize the majority of the eggs in the cluster. Um, so we'll lay those eggs inside and instead of stink bugs emerging from the eggs, there'll be little tiny wasps that emerge from the eggs. Another really great one is uh, the, the cucumber beetle parasitoid. This is a pretty nondescript fly, so you probably wouldn't be able to recognize it um, unless you saw it kind of near near some cucumber beetle larvae, um, which are usually underground, so you're probably not seeing them either. Um, so these are actually really cool. Uh, they pupate, and when they pupate, the head usually pops off the cucumber beetle. I've done some collection of cucumber beetles to see what percentage of them have been parasitized. Um, and it's always interest, you know, it's always interesting to see how many of their heads pop off and you get this little kind of pupil casing. So these are something that are helping us uh, with all those cucumber beetles that infest our garden. Some ones that maybe we don't like so much are the parasitoids of monarchs, right? There's actually a, quite a few parasitoids of monarchs. Um, this is a little wasp that will parasitize the, the pupa. And then here is a tachinid fly that will parasitize the larvae. I actually, someone brought me a monarch pupa once and they're like, didn't emerge, what's going on? And I had it in a bag and a few days later, uh, hundreds of these little wasps came out. And in fact, there are actually two kinds of wasps because parasitoids also have parasitoids. So those are called hyperparasitoids. So there's there's a lot of diversity here in, in this insect kingdom. So, you know, parasitoids, you probably, you might not ever see them, um, but they are there. So what, what can you do? It's the same thing that you're doing for your predators and your pollinators. You're providing food for the host, right? So, you know, if you're planting cucumbers in your garden, you're providing food for those cucumber beetles and then the parasitoids can, can then move in. And then also it's really important to reduce pesticide use. Um, when you're using pesticides, you're mostly killing the ho the the pests, but in an, an attempt to decrease the risk for non-insect pests or and humans, they have made insecticides are more specific to things that insects have. So for, instead of targeting you know a system that we share with them, 
of just like your cell membrane, like we have a cell membrane, they have a cell membrane, they're targeting like their molting, how they molt, all of the chemicals or the pathways that lead to molting. So if you are attacking one insect, all the other insects have that same pathway. And so uh, a lot of insecticides these days are, have reduced risk for humans, but there's increased risk of harming other insects. So pesticide use is something that we really use as a last resort. resort. So that's all we got today. So I hope you enjoyed our program. We talked about our our predators, our pollinators, and our parasitoids, um, and we'd really appreciate if you join us next month. Next month, we'll be talking about invasive plants, so like this awful barberry and this Japanese knotweed, which is pervasive here in Orange County. <laughs>